Okay, let's let's go. Um, so hi everybody. Um, we're we are talking today about Postgres replication. Hi, um, I'm um, the CEO of PostgreSQL Experts. We're a small Postgres consultancy. We're in Alameda, California, uh, across the bay from San Francisco. Um, and that's my email address. That's the that's my personal blog, thebuild.com, and there's my Twitter account. These slides will be up on thebuild.com basically when I next time I'm at suitable connectivity. So okay. Um, okay. So we're gonna talk about what you can do. Postgres has like all the replication options. So we're gonna talk about them. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about is wall shipping, which is the almost the oldest historically, except for a little quirk, which we'll talk about. Um, streaming replication, trigger-based replication, logical decoding-based replication, the, 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 both the, the old, the once and future replication technique for Postgres, and a few exotic animals on replication. Um, since there aren't very many of us, which is fine, um, feel free to ask questions as we go. So um, I'm, that's me, um, I said all that. Um, I've been doing Postgres stuff since 7.1, um, long time ago. Um, actually, just decommissioned the 7.1 server yes, last year. It's kind of sad. Um, so, um, so the first thing you have to understand to understand how replication works in Postgres is you kind of need to understand the write-ahead log. Um, the write-ahead log is a continuous stream of data changes that are written to local storage. It's been around, actually not since the beginning, uh, but since version of the sevens. Um, we didn't used to have it, but that, well, by, we've, we've had it for the, the duration of this century, so I guess that counts. Mm -hmm. um, every database does the same thing. Um, in the case of Postgres, it's a series of records, of variable length records, um, and each record is a specific change to an underlying disk level item in Postgres. So it said, it's things like update field number three of CTID this, of relation OA this to cat. That's the kind of thing that's in the record. I mean, not this literal string, of course, but that's the kind of information that's stored. Um, who knows what a CTID is, just out of curiosity in Postgres? So sometime when you're log, who's running a Postgres database, even just for your own amusement? Sometime you log in and do select CTID from table, semicolon return, for a table that has rows in it. You'll be surprised. You have a column called CTID and you never knew. Um, the CTID is kind of the physical address of a row on the disk. That's the, the post, that's the page number, uh, a series of the 8K page number, and that's the, the um, tuple within that page. Um, every, um, don't use this for anything. Please don't use this as like a key, because it changes all the time. Like every time you update a row, it'll change, for example. So, um, with, with some exceptions. But it's not intended as a universal key or anything like that. It's how Postgres addresses a page. For example, in an index, this is what the index points to, is the CTID. All tables and indexes and everything have an object identifier called an OID in Postgres that um, one of the first things the planner does when you type in a query is it replaces all the table names and everything with their OIDs. Um, and fields in Postgres are an offset. Every time you create a new field, it gives it a new, a new index. So even if you delete a field in Postgres, it, that number never goes away, it's just marked as this field doesn't exist anymore, it is always null. Um, one, thing, one thing that can be surprising is occasionally we'll have people, I'll, I'll, we'll try writing some kind of algorithm which creates and it adds and removes a row, repeat a, a, two, a, a column repeatedly to a Postgres table, and that works for 1,600 times then fails, because you can have a maximum of 1,600 columns in a Postgres table, including deleted ones. Oops, so anyway. <laughs> Back to this. So the, the point of this exercise is these are this is a fairly low level record. It's very much related to actually how the data is laid out on disk. It's not um, it's not a high level logical kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> um, if you it's written it's physically written to the disk as a series of sixteen megabyte segments. Each one's a file, and they have these big hexadecimal file names whose structure I will not go, go into right now, but it's intriguing, you should look it up sometime. Um, these are actual files on disk. Um, on pre-version Postgres 10, they were in a directory called pg underscore xlog. 
Um, enough people looked at the looked at the name pg underscore xlog and went, oh look, it's log files. Well, I can just delete those because I'm getting tight on space and cause your server to be unrecoverable. So as uh, so of version 10, it was changed to pg underscore wall. But go, you can go into the Postgres files, and the Postgres database is just a bunch of files. Look for the directory called pg underscore xlog 96 or earlier, pg underscore wall 10 or later, and you'll see a bunch of these. The reason the wall exists in the first place is to do crash recovery. Um, the, um, because at any one moment, there is stuff that's been modified but hasn't been flushed to disk yet and is sitting around in Postgres' shared buffers. So if the server crashes in that moment, absent the write ahead log, that data would be gone forever. And in fact, because there's no real synchronous algorithm for how this stuff is written, you may end up with a corrupt, inconsistent database. That's bad. So what happens is Postgres checkpoints once in a while. People know what a checkpoint is in Postgres world? Basically, it's a point in time at which everything that's in shared buffers is pushed out to disk. And a point is declared that says, OK, at this moment, the database is now fully consistent. So what happens is Postgres rewinds back in time and looks for the wall segment that, could, that would happen during that checkpoint and then replays the operations that are recorded in the wall. And once it reaches the end of the wall, consistency, you're back to the same state you were, and this database comes back up. It generates a ton of noise and logs about this. So sometime if you have an experimental database, you know, do a bunch of updates and stuff like that, crash it, um, which you can actually, you can crash Postgres by doing a PG, um, by doing a dash uh, M immediate shutdown on it that actually crashes Postgres, um, which is okay because we have the right head log for recovery. Um, and then start back up again. You can see a bunch of stuff in the, in the wall, or the, in the text logs, where it's saying, oh, I recovered this segment, I recovered this segment. Kill that is kind of fun. Yeah, you know, it's, don't do it on your production database, because you'll probably get saved <laughs> text. You know, Slack will wake up rather, rather hostily to you. But on a test database, why not? And once it reaches consistency during this replay, we're back up. Now, the important thing to remember then is, <clears throat> at any one point that the wall is, can't, is a constant stream of these updates and is constantly um, recording what it needs to know to bring Postgres back to a consistent state and reapply any change that's been made. So you can imagine that you could, in theory, from t, t equals zero, create a blank Postgres database, keep every wall segment that was ever created throughout history, reapply it to another blank database, and you get the same database back. And you really could do this. That's not theoretic. This would work. Um, you, the reason we have checkpoints is at some point you have to say, OK, that's enough wall. Thank you very much. I don't want 12 terabytes of wall. And replaying 12 terabytes of wall would take, you know, we'd be looking at heat death of the universe to replay the whole thing. So the, one of the points of the checkpoint is you can sort of snip the wall and throw away the old stuff. But this raises an interesting question. Hmm. OK, we have this right ahead log. And we have the database. And if we have. A, a, a consistent copy, a, a copy of the database, we could apply the write ahead log. Well, what if we did it to a different system than the one that crashed? What if we took the wall, we took two copies of the same database, and, were, and took the wall that was being generated from one and applied it to the other? Hmm, okay, that's an interesting idea. Because even if the original system was still in operation, is continually generating new wall, every time it generated enough wall, let's say one of these 16 megabyte segments that it writes to this, we moved it over to the other system and applied it. Now we'd effectively be replicating, right? Well, that's a really intriguing idea. So, you know, we can keep it up to date with the primary. Um, by the way, official Postgres terminology, and I use it in the, consistently in this, is the primary is the one that's generating wall, and secondaries are the ones that are consuming wall, okay? Postgres doesn't use master and slave terminology. This was a big fight, but we don't use that. So, you know, um, the, so if you go Googling around in the docs for master and slave, you won't find it. The terms Postgres uses are primary and secondary. Um, and in version 8, this was such a good idea, it was implemented. And it's called wall shipping. Because you are literally picking up the wall and shipping it to another system. Now, so far, make sense so far? Basically, mm -hmm. get it? OK, cool. Um, so now, how do we actually implement this stuff? So how do we make this go? So there's a, in postgresql.conf, there's a command called, there's a, a, a parameter called archive command. 
it's archive command equals string. And what string is intended to be is a shell command. It forks off a shell and runs whatever you tell it to do. Now, it can do anything. You know, you can set min slash true, you know, whatever you like. Um, but what it's supposed to do is take the file, and it, 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 there's, you know, at sign p, at sign f, kind of, or excuse me, not at sign, percent sign, uh, parameter substitution so it can tell you which wall segment it's talking about. What, you're, what it's supposed to do is pick up that wall segment and move it somewhere that the other system can get at it. Like SCP, although don't use SCP, use RSync. It can push it up to cloud storage. Um, the reason you shouldn't use SCP is SCP is not atomic, RSync is. Um, relative to file name, it's atomic. Um, or, and <clears throat> so it, it will pick up the wall statement and push it up to wherever it wants to go. It doesn't know anything else. It doesn't know where these files are going, it doesn't know what you're planning to do with them, doesn't care. It's just pushing these files out every time it's done with one. The secondary, in its um, configuration file called recovery.com, has a, a sort of a matching command called restore command, which it runs repeatedly saying, do you have a new wall segment? No. Do you, do you have one now? It's really persistent and irritating. Um, good thing it's not talking to a person because it's be like one of those childs that are we there yet? Are we there yet? Um, like as on a fairly fast duty cycle, it's polling to see if, it, if there's a new file. If there is one, restore command is supposed to pick it up from wherever it's, it is and copy it to a local direct to someplace local. It happens to copy it to PG underscore X log, PG underscore wall, but don't worry about that. You know, they're really PG underscore um, X log and PG underscore walls should have big, no user serviceable parts inside signs on them. Let Postgres manage that that data, but. It, so what happens is archive command runs, pushes the segment out on the secondary, restore command runs, finds that that wall file exists, and the way it no, the way by find it doesn't exist, it means it doesn't return an error when it runs, and copies it in, and then Postgres processes it just as if it was just as if it had crashed. This is why a secondary is it, we'll talk about a secondary being in recovery, because it is literally running the same process as if the secondary had crashed. It was getting the wall segments locally. It's, it's literally the same code that runs inside the secondary. Okay, and this works great. And for a long time, this was the only kind of replication we had, um, at least in core. So the good part about this is, it's really cheap and cheerful to set up. You just need to be able to copy files around. You have to have rsync, and it has to work. And it has to have a place for the files to go. <clears throat> so, that's, uh, so it really doesn't take much engineering to set up. Um, it's really good on slower, unreliable connections because it doesn't need a persistent connection at any point. It just needs to be able to push a file up and pull it down. But it doesn't have to leave a TCP IP connection open. So if you have crappy networking, which sometimes you can do in LANs, um, this is nice because, it's very, because it doesn't require a constantly open high-speed TCP IP connection. Um, one nice part about it is you can use it as a basis for point-in-time recovery on Postgres. Because again, imagine that you have a crash system and a ton of wall. And you start replaying the wall, but at some point you say, okay, oh look, the, you know, the, this, this clock is ticking, and you know, it's sort of like time travel, it's in the, you know, the time travel meter in Back to the Future. And it says, no, it's 10 a.m. yesterday, stop. You can recreate your database at a, at a previous point in time if you have a backup that precedes that point in time and the wall information. This is called point in time recovery for obvious reasons in Postgres. And it's very, very handy for forensic reasons. You know, DBA drops a table by accident. I've done it. Um, you know, all sorts of stuff. So, just a, a quick question. Sure. That's all right. uh, so, you mentioned uh, slow or unreliable networks. So, let's say uh, systems disconnected for a while or there's a time issue or something of the sort. Uh, it's pretty easy for uh, the wall to, when the primary and the secondary then uh, can talk to each other for it to catch up. Yeah, I mean, it will, what will happen is if archive command runs and, and it returns and, and an error status comes back, basically non-zero comes back, it'll, it will say, ooh, I didn't archive that and keep it around. It won't recycle it or re repurpose it for any reason. Which is, um, now of course you can also run yourself out of this space that way if it never returns to true. But, um, and we'll talk about that. But yes, that is correct. Um, oh, one more, one last little thing. Um, the, the, the nice part about this is it runs on um, pre-9.0 versions of Postgres. 
why are you running a pre 9.0 version of Postgres? I was running mine for nostalgic reasons, but, but you know, that's, so <laughs> please, please don't run 9, 8, 8.3 or anything like that. But if you must, it works on 8.3. So there, the another good is, one of the best features of Postgres, and this is true of no other database product, is DDL changes are transactional in Postgres. You can say begin, create table, a rollback, and it'll throw away the table create. No other, no other ma major RDBMS will do this. This is unique to Postgres. The reason it does this is, as far as Postgres is concerned, DDL changes like creating tables and stuff like that are just transactional, are just transactional modifications of the system catalog tables. <coughs> it treats them exactly the same way. So you can roll them back. This is great for migrations, because you can bundle all your migrations inside the transaction, and if anything fails, they get rolled back, and you can go and look at what happened, rather than have this database in this weird, inconsistent state. Anyone in Oracle with an Oracle background know what Oracle does here? It automatically commits any open transaction and applies each change in order. So if you have an open transaction, say create table, you've just committed the transaction you applied and you've done the create table. That's, that's exactly the behavior we want, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the nice part about this is since they're in the wall, they're pushed out to secondaries automatically. So they're in the wall, so the wall, will, it'll replay them just like it replays any other change. So this means you don't have to do anything fancy to distribute table DDL changes, changes to your schema. It just, they just happen automatically. In fact, you can't prevent them from happening. So the secondary is a perfect mirror, allowing for replication lag, of course, because nothing, nothing's instant, of the primary. And if you set it up right, you can, you, you can read from it. You can't write to the secondary, but you can read from it so you can use it for load balancing query distribution or run your PG dump from it instead of from the primary or whatever you like. <clears throat> Failover is really, really easy. If you're keeping the secondary around primarily to prevent if there's destruction of the, of the primary, um, you can promote it, and it usually takes like less than a minute to come back up. So your, your downtime is very, very low. So for disaster recovery and you know primary dies, this is great. Okay, nothing's perfect. So here's the bad stuff. Um, the secondary in this case is only as up to date as that last 16 megabyte wall segment, so you can lose some changes. If you are at 16 megabytes minus one byte and it hasn't shipped that segment yet, and the meteorite comes down and smashes and destroys your primary, well, too bad. You've lost all that data forever. Um, you have to manage these things because they are these, they're just files and they're picked up and copied over. So if the, if, you, um, if the archive command starts failing, they'll start piling up on the primary. Wherever they're going has to be cleaned up too because you, can't co you, can co you, you, don't, you don't inject them directly into the pg underscore xlog directory of the, of the secondary. Don't do that. Never touch the underscore xlog directory or underscore wall directory. So they have to go somewhere else. And so you, and you need some kind of algorithm to decide, I don't need this wall segment anymore. If you're copying them locally to the secondary, Postgres provides command to handle this for you called uh, archive cleanup command. But if you're copying them like to cloud storage, like to S3, you have to be a little more sophisticated on how you manage them. Um, if you're copying to multiple secondaries, all of them have to get the file. So you need a little more complex orchestration. Co um, copying them to S3 is really nice in this regard because you can just dump them all into S3 and it can pull everything else out of S3. So that part's good. Um, S3, there are some complications though about retention. One, um, if, at, at the end, if we want, we can talk about a little bit about, so the number one thing is everybody does this. They say, I know, no problem. I'll set a life cycle rule on my F3 bucket that keeps 60 days worth. What could go wrong? And the answer is you might be unable to bring up your Postgres server is what could go wrong. So don't do that. You have to be a little more clever than that. Um, <clears throat> the secondary can't be written at all. And Postgres has a very strict definition of being able to write. You can't create a temporary table. You can't, you can't update a materialized view. You can't do anything that would cause the disk image to diverge from the primary at all. So, for example, if you're doing data, a lot of data analysis queries, want to run, create temporary tables and stuff like that, sorry, you can't do it on a, on a, on a binary replica in Postgres. Not happening. Um, suppose you have, like, you say, well, I want to have a data warehouse and I don't need all this, 
I don't need all these tables. I just need these tables. Well, too bad. Um, the wall's a global resource across all the databases, across everything inside of a Postgres server. So you can't pick and choose what you get. You, you have to replicate all the fields and all the columns and all the, and all the databases and hope that's what you wanted. Um, and you can't consolidate multiple servers into a single one using wall shipping. Like if you have a bunch of front-end databases that are transactional and they're all dumping, you want to consolidate them into a big old data warehouse, not happening using wall shipping. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> this is the number one question is like people say, well, I want to do an upgrade from 9.5 from nine to 9.6 or from 9.6 to 10. And I want to use binary replication. The answer is you can't. Sorry. Um, you can't replicate between major versions of PostgreSQL. You can replicate just fine between minor versions, like 9.6.8 uh, will replicate just fine into 9.6.9 and vice versa. But um, also, uh, just a note, Postgres changed its numbering scheme between 9.6 and 10. It used to be 9.5.9.6.9.7. Uh, the, the, the version that should have come after uh, 9.6 would have been 9.7. But instead, they, they, um, now they sort of shifted everything over by one. It used to be the, the, the number after the dot was the major version. Now it's the, the, the leading number is the major version, and the one after the dot's the minor version. So going from 10.1 to 10.2 is a minor version upgrade, but going from 10 to 11 is a major version upgrade. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's what we had in version eight, and it works pretty well. But it had limitations and it wasn't great. You know, there were some things we didn't like about it. So, well, what if we didn't, but you know, we're throwing these files around and that seems all very 1997. Why don't we just open a network connection and stream the wall information down? Because that means the secondary could stay a lot closer to the primary. We wouldn't have to wait for each of these wall segments to get propagated. And that's all streaming replication is. It's exactly the same thing only the secondary opens a TCP IP connection to the primary, and the primary just pushes the wall information down to it directly. That's it. They are essentially the same technology. Um, you use this recovery.com file, it's a configuration file that lives inside the Postgres data directory, um, to point the secondary at the primary and tell it, okay, this machine's your primary. Um, the secondary opens the connection just to note that the secondary is always the one that initiates these things. The secondary initiates the connection into the primary. And otherwise, it's the same as wall shipping. Keynote. Um, stream, stream replication. Stream replication? That typo's been in the slides for like two years. Um, the, the secondary stays very close to the primary. It can stay within milliseconds of the primary. Um, if you turn on, optionally turn on synchronous replication, the chance of a lost transaction, um, where the, which a transaction that's been committed on the primary but not on the secondary is essentially zero. Because what happens is the primary will wait, um, will wait to return its commit message. Uh, you know, the, the client of the primary issues a commit. The, second, the primary will wait until the secondary, all, either all or quorum or however you have it configured, of the secondary saying, yes, I committed that too, and then return back to the client. Now that doesn't do great things for your throughput, um, but you can turn it on and off on a per transaction basis. So you can have like, okay, I'm doing the, somebody, I'm doing the, somebody pulled the money out of the ATM transaction as opposed to the, the, I just sent them their balance email transaction. Yes? Um, a few years back, I remember there was a conversation uh, at a conference that synchronous replication required multiple secondaries, otherwise it would be a little screwed up. Not that I'm aware of. At least that, that's certainly not the current situation. Um, you can, now you can, um, um, one thing that is a, a semi-new feature of Postgres is you can do kind of, you can do really exotic things with synchronous replication like forum commit. You can say, okay, I have five secondaries and I'll wait for three of them to acknowledge instead of all of them. But as far as, far as I know, it works just fine with a single secondary. It would be a weird topology to do it that way because if you had a single secondary, well, depends on what you're doing. But, um, um, but yeah, no, it works fine. In, in that situation, you definitely want to turn it on and off depending on the value of the transaction, uh, how important the transaction is to be recovered. Because if you run it full-time synchronous replication, your, your performance is going to be awful. Um, you can also cascade replicas. So you can have tertiaries and 
quaternaries or however you want to say it, you know, replicas off of replicas off of replicas to, to an unlimited depth, although by the end of the chain, the replication lag is going to get so pretty, pretty breathtaking. Okay, and it works great. It is the primary way of doing, of having a failover machine in Postgres right now to this day. Really no reason to do anything different. It does have some weirdnesses though. The first one is replication delay. And this is different from lag. They're related to lag, but it's different from replication lag. So the problem is these changes are all binary. And so they kind of go in under the SQL transactional level and kind of pound the disk directly. And the question is when a wall change to this data comes in the secondary, but let's say the secondary is running a query that uses that same table. What should we do? Nothing isn't the right answer because we could change data that query relies on. And you could get a bad answer back, transaction, you know, a, a, an answer that is not possible from an asset compliance point of view, and that's not okay. If we just apply the change under the query, you could get a wrong answer. So we, we, there, you have one of two options. You can delay applying the change until the query completes. You can just say, oh, stop the replication stream, wait for the query to finish. Uh, the query finishes, lift the, lift the gate, it applies. That works. Or you can say, oh, a uh, client is running that query, sorry, something bad happened, try again later. You get it again, and an error comes back. These both work, so the question is, what should we do? And the answer is, well, you get to pick. Um, there are two parameters, one for streaming and one for wall shipping, that control how long to wait before canceling the query. So when a change comes in that would cause a conflict, a timer starts running. When that timer expires, it cancels the query. It, um, um, up until then, it holds the wall stream. You can set, and you have a full range of settings. You can set it to infinity, which is, well, negative one, which interprets as infinity, which means wait forever, never cancel a query. Or you can set to zero, which means instantly cancel the query. Higher settings do mean more potential replication lag, for obvious reasons. If you set it to infinity, you could, you, um, it could wait a long, long time for that query to finish. In, kind of mo in, in larger scale production systems, what we recommend is dedicate a server to failover with these set to zero, so it stays as close as possible. And the other servers for read-only traffic set as high as you need them to be, so you don't get excessive query cancellations. There's a setting called hot standby feedback. These page level changes can be generated by, of course, standard database operations like insert and update and delete. They can also be um, created by maintenance operations like vacuum. And those cause query cancellations too. And those can be a little surprising because it's like, I wasn't touching this table in the primary, why are you canceling my query? And the reason is Postgres would have woke up and vacuumed it. So hot standby feedback sends feedback from the secondary up to the primary saying, I'm working on this table right now, could you please stop vacuum it? And it works pretty well. Um, the primary then defers vacuuming to avoid query cancellations. The problem is if, you, if this, you do this too much, if you're constantly pounding this table on the secondary, it will never get vacuumed on the primary, and that's bad. Basically, it can result in bloat, bad statistics, all sorts of weird things can happen. <coughs> um, it, and it doesn't completely eliminate all query cancellations. So it's useful, but do monitor your bloat very carefully um, if you do that. If you go to, go to our GitHub repo, PG experts, you can see queries to monitor bloat. Good idea, monitor load. There's also this setting called vacuum defer cleanup age. Don't change it. Nobody knows how to set it right. Okay. Well, that was that was all you know. Pretty interesting stuff, and we're you know, and a lot of useful um, ways of handling um, um, handling it. But it had a lot of limitations. So what should we do? Well, there's trigger based replication. Um, you know, well, it has a lot of limitations, like no selectivity or replication, same major version, these stuff that's not so great. But Postgres has a really elaborate trigger mechanism. It has all this, you know, you can run almost anything in a trigger. I just recently saw some a code where inside of a trigger, someone was running a Python function, which imported um, uh, URL lib2 and did, a, and, and did an HTTP request. Don't do that in a trigger. That's bad. But you can. It let you. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and then they were wondering why the trigger was slow. Um, so what if we attach a trigger to each table and cut all the insert and delete and everything operations and push them to the secondary that way? Well, yes, we can do that, and we do. 
Actually, this predated wall-based replication. This was the very, very first way of doing replication in Postgres in a product called Sloney 1. Um, so now we have basically these guys. Sloney, which is written in C, Lundist, which is written in Python, or Lundiste. I can never, it, it varies how you pronounce this. Or Bucardo, which is written in Perl. Just a quick note, Bucardo, a, um, a Bucardo is an extinct family of goat. It was one of the first mammals to be cloned, um, which is why it's called Bucardo. Um, plus some others that work the same way. <coughs> so it's much more flexible than wall-based replication. You know, depending on which package you pick, you can replicate only some databases, replicate only some tables, replicate only some fields, don't have to replicate everything. You can filter changes based on rules of the primary before sending them over. So you can say, well, okay, only push these changes that pass this predicate, or things like that. Really nice. Um, you can build really exotic topologies. You know, you can merge things together, you can do all sorts of stuff. Consolidate multiple databases into a single database for data warehousing. That's really cool. Bucardo only does multi-master where the two where two tables can replicate to each other. You know, by two tables I mean two tables with identical schemas, you know, running on this running on two different machines. I mean they're not conceptually the same table, but you know what I mean. Um, and this works between different Postgres Go major versions. So you can use it for zero downtime upgrading. And by zero, I mean really low. You replicate, replicate, left, replicate, shut down the old one, bring up the new one, rehome your application, you're done. So you can do it very fast. But as always, there's bad stuff. It's really tedious and fiddly to set this up. This is what, where you hire people like us. Um, Every table that's going to be replicated needs a primary key, at least a de facto one, because you because you have to have some idea of row identity. You know, otherwise, because if it sends over a change that says update this row, but there's no primary key, what's this row? The whole point of a primary key is so rows have identity. You have to copy. You have to initial. If you're doing the, you, you have to copy the whole database over, and that could take some time. The, you know, no, the the source database isn't down while it's happening, but it does take some time. And it's kind of an awkward fit with wall-based replication for failover, because you have a primary that's replicating out a bunch of data and doing all this stuff, and then it fails over. The question is, where in the logical replication stream was it when it failed over? And that can be a surprisingly hard question to answer. And those triggers cost those, <laughs> those triggers cost money. You know, they, they they they're firing all the time on every change. They can have a performance impact. And there's no, none of that automatic DDL change distribution. If you alter a table on the primary, it's up to you to figure out how to get it to the secondary. All of them provide commands to do it, but there's, no, but it, there's nothing that says, oh, I made a change to the primary, it'll just happen on the secondary. Of these, so, so it tends to be the highest performance because it's written in C, but you have to be able to install C language. Um, who's running on RDS? Nobody. Looking into it. But, RD, you know, R R RDS, RDS, classic RDS I, I don't have is, is not so bad. Um, but you don't get it. You can install your own C language extensions, which means you can't run that. Um, you have to run, you, well, these requires PL Python U. Um, the U at the end of a, of a procedural language name in Postgres means untrusted, which means that it can, have, it can access the file system um, and, and processes without it being intermediate. So you don't have that on RDS either. Um, Bucardo can work entirely inside the subscriber, um, but not provider system. So you can use it on RDS. We frequently use this way of moving in and out of RDS. Um, Bucardo also supports multi-master um, operation and primary key updates, where you change the primary key on a row, and none of the others do. So that's pretty nice. So. We have a new hotness in Postgres, which I'm just about to get to, which is what you should be using. But So you should use this if you can. But it's um, still useful for major version upgrades where the, the major version was uh, below 9.4. Um, and sometimes you have to use it in specialized environments where you don't have access to built logical replication of the wall stream in specific RDS. Now, RDS does let you get to lot, do um, built-in logical replication now on more modern versions. So. Second. Okay, now the new hotness in Postgres, logical decoding. It was first introduced in 9.4. In, in it's not a package system like streaming replication. Streaming replication is kind of this, you know, 
um, built in, you know, this sort of all-in-one system. It just works, you know. Not all, everything that you need comes in the box. Um, it's a framework for building things on top of. Um, it really required 96 to get going. Um, what it does is it reads the wall stream and turns it back into SQL operations. SQL type operations, not literally SQL operations. So it takes this and turns it back into update to menagerie set animal type equals cat where ID equals 33, kind of to a first approximation. It doesn't literally rebuild this string, but it makes it possible to recreate strings like you know, that kind of operation. So it doesn't reconstruct the actual SQL or build back to uh, SQL, but you can write a plugin that does. It's based on this technology called replication slots that were introduced in 9.4. It's a named object that captures the wall stream. You can think of it kind of like a spigot on the side of the database that the wall stream pours out of. So you can get at it as it's being generated. Um, once you create a replication slot, when you create it, you say, take the wall stream and feed it into this plugin. So it's into a specified plugin. The plugin is just a piece of C code that lives inside the server that absorbs the wall stream and does something with it. Postgres doesn't know what it does with it, doesn't care. The only thing it does care about is it says, okay, I've absorbed this much wall stream, I'm done with it, if you need to recycle that wall file, that's fine. So it reports its position in the wall stream, how much it's consumed, but, it doesn't, but Postgres doesn't care what else it does with it. Um, note that it does keep track of how much it's consumed though. So um, if the consumer stops consuming for some reason, the framework retains all the wall information so it can catch up forever. So this results in wall statements being recycled. So you, we now have a whole new way for you to run yourself out of disk space. So if you create a replication slot, you do have to monitor your disk very closely to make sure this it, it isn't piling up. But you should always be monitoring your disk space. So. Um, a plugin, again, is just a bit of C code. It's like any extension in Postgres. That, um, that receives the logical decoding records. It can do anything it wants with them. It can do logging, auditing, feed them to an external data system, AD1. Um, you can replicate them into Kafka using that, if you like, what you like. Um, Postgres ships with a test plugin that provides example code and things like that, but you don't really use it for anything except be amusing yourself. So, However, built on this technology is logical replication, where you logically replicate from one Postgres server to another. On version 10 and higher, it's built into core. On 9.4, there's an extension called PG Logical you can install. Um, from the second plug. Okay. So the high level view is it takes this stream of decoded changes up and applies them at the SQL level. It means constraints are enforced, rows are locked, triggers can fire, MVCC happens. It works just like you were typing the statements into, into it. Um, a database can be both a publisher of changes and a subscriber of changes, so you can build exotic topologies and all sorts of weird stuff. You can't do multi-master, but you can do everything else. Um, a single table can be both a source and a target as long as there's no ping-ponging, because that's what multi-master, multi-master, to multi-master work you need ping-pong protection where it changes just keep bouncing back and forth between two tables. But a single table can, for example, one can be pushed into and then pushed out of to another server but no bidirectional replication. Um, generally, this is set up by using a PG dump with schema only to mirror, to clone the schema over to a, a new server. Um, the both, everything can do an initial bulk copy. The nice part about that is it, while it's doing the bulk copy, it's also retaining the changes so that um, you're, it stays consistent with the, the source. Um, DDL changes are not propagated. Um, PG logical provides a function for do it. Incore leaves it up to you. Version 11 has some extensions in this regard, but basically it's up to you to make sure DDL gets propagated. Um, all tables have to be replicated, have to have some kind of row identity, um, either a unique key or, or a primary index or a unique key. PG logical requires either a primary key or a single unique index, which is pretty much a primary key. Um, Incore can use the entire row value to identify the row if all else fails. Um, although, if you have completely 100% duplicate rows, you're in trouble, so come up with something. Um, one kind of awkward thing is sequence values are not replicated. The row values that are set by them are set. So if you have a primary key that's based off of a sequence, the primary key itself is replicated, but where the sequence has incremented to is not replicated because those aren't recorded in the wall stream. 
PG Logical has a background process that pushes them out occasionally. Um, Incore doesn't do anything. Um, if you're consolidating to a single table, use distinct ranges in the, or non-sequence keys. Um, I like UUIDs for this a lot. Um, logical replicas are generally not suitable for failover because of this, because you don't know where their sequences are relative to the primary. If I remember correctly, Sloney has a mechanism that allows you to keep track of the sequence. Yes, yeah, so Sloney does, Bucardo does as well. They, they both replicate them by pulling them and pushing them across. Um, I believe one of these did, does too. I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. Um, Incore logical replication doesn't replicate truncate at all at present. Um, PG logical replicates it, but it doesn't do truncate cascades, so be, just be aware of that. Um, you can only replicate from a real table to a real table. So materialized views or views or foreign tables or partition root tables, stuff like that, you can't replicate between those two because um, mo partition root tables in modern in uh, version in, in the new enhanced Postgres partitioning aren't real tables. PG Logical 3 has some improvements here. Um, so version 10 partitioning, it's not a real table, so it can't participate in, in logical replication of a source or destination, which is really annoying. Um, uh, I, I need to test this. I believe you could do this with old style partitioning, but you kind of don't want to use old style partitioning. And if none of what I'm saying makes sense, we can talk about it after. It uses the right hand log, so it can't replicate temporary or unlogged tables because those don't appear in the Wall Street. Um, copy operations are broken into individual inserts and individual statements are enrolled. So if you change 10,000 rows with a single update, it'll come across as 10,000 updates. So because the, it's, it's reading the wall, not the actual SQL that's being presented. Similarly, copy, if you copy 50,000 rows, you get 50,000 inserts. Um, PG Logical does have some features InCore doesn't have right now. Um, it has more flexible conflict handling, so if you try to apply a change and a constraint gets violated, PG Logical has some choices. Um, um, Incore just stops and waits for you to fix it. Um, you can filter by rows and columns, sequence replication, stuff like that. PG Logical requires an extension to be built and installed. It's not part of the core distribution. Um, and this is like a trivial change, but it's true. PG Logical is operated by functions. Uh, in-core replication is largely operated by using SQL statements, if you care. Um, we w I will say in-core replication is faster than the initial copy, sometimes by a factor of two. So, um, Only a primary node can be a publisher or subscriber, not a, not a, a, a binary secondary. If a, if a primary of logical subscriber fails over to a secondary, the current logical replication state is not passed over which is this problem I alluded to earlier where you don't quite know in the replication stream where you are. And this can be a problem on failover. So you can get synchronization problems. Um, you can have like changes in streaming secondary that have not been pushed down to the subscribers and you don't know that when you fail over. So that's kind of annoying. Um, every time I give this talk, I say maybe the next major version will fix this. Hopefully maybe version 13 will fix it. If you're on RDS, if you're on 9, 6, 11 or higher, not 10, 11, you get PG Logical. And on 10, you get in-core replication. Unless you're on Aurora. Aurora doesn't support it yet. Um, can be, and you can use it for both RDS and non-RDS targets. Yay, huge advantage. You can't supply your own logical decoding plugin though. But I won't. Okay, <clears throat> and lastly, just a couple, a few exotic animals, because there's some interesting things lurking out there in the replication jungle. Um, who's ever used PG Pool? That's so, you know, okay. Yeah, me too. Um, PG Pool has this feature where it can take the rep incoming uh, statement stream and split it between two servers and applies the same statements to both servers. So every operation is applied to both. This is actually from the pre logical wall streaming days of a way of keeping a replica up to date. Please do not use this feature. It's both unsupported and extremely, uh, extremely broken. And you can imagine, it's so easy for these two things to fall out of sync, and then you're totally out. <clears throat> Amazon Data Migration Service. It's just sitting there. It looks so promising. It's this like bright, shiny fruit hanging in the Amazon jungle. Um, on Postgres Go, it's based on logical decoding, too. Nice of them. It's primarily designed for migration between different database types, though. It doesn't support some important Postgres features, like 
timestamp TZ, which any real database will have columns of type timestamp TZ. Um, it's not really useful for PostgreSQL migration, but don't take my word for it. Amazon says it's not also. So, oh well. Um, second Quadrant has a commercial product, VDR. Um, it's, has a, it shares many similarities to uh, PG Logical. They're both based on the same code base. Um, it's currently a proprietary product. Second Quadrant says they'll op open source in the future. I assume they will. It can do bidirectional multi-master replication. It can do this whole mesh topology thing where you have 20 servers distributed all over the globe and they're all replicating to each other. Very nice. There are other commercial solutions. There are lots of them, actually. If you Google for database replication, you will be choked by the number of solutions. Mostly they're trigger-based. Some of the more recent ones use logical decoding, though. Um, generally, they're intended as a package solution for, for between database product migrations, like you're moving from Oracle to Postgres or things like that. Um, or to get changes into non-relational systems for, for other purposes. They're not generally intended as Postgres to Postgres generalized migration tools. So, what should you do with all that? For failover, just use stream replication. That's what it's there for, it's very good at it. Um, for read-only queries, for load balancing, use stream replicas that aren't dedicated to failover so that you don't have to worry about the, the, the secondary falling behind because of queries. If you need logical replication because you need something that, that um, streaming doesn't provide, use InCore unless you need a PG logical feature. Um, both because InCore is kind of the wave of the future, you know, it's uh, that kind of thing. It is a little fat, it is faster on the initial copy in our experience. So, um, PG logical is a perfectly nice piece of code and all that. We just have better success and it's all with InCore. Except I can't. I'm broken. There we go. So that's the that that you, you could have just gotten the slide and not sat through this whole thing. Um, and thank you. That's the talk. Um, Any residual questions? Yeah, question there a little bit. You uh, talked briefly on uh, Amazon RDS uh -huh. uh, and proof on Aurora there. As far as your advice slide there. Um, you touched that it supports PG log logical previously in Picardo. Do you have a, a preference on? Well, I would definitely use in-core logical replication over Picardo. Okay. Picardo is a nice piece of code, and I have a lot of experience with it. Um, but if if I never have to touch another trigger-based replication product, that I will be happy. <laughs> you know, the, and, and and not because they were you know foolishly written or bad code or anything like that. They were just uh, you know there's a much better solution now in the form of logical replication uh, in core. And it works great. Um, yeah. Um, two sets of questions. One, uh, what's your state of knowledge of how Google and Microsoft are doing on that front? And the second set of questions is the import uh, logical replication, uh, the PG logical replication. Any idea when they're going to deal with the reconciliation rules? So, um, define a reconciliation rule for me. PG logical, you know, when you have your conflicts. Oh, like a conflict handling, you know, more advanced conflict handling. Um, I would say that they are still in the bike shedding stage on that, based on what I see go by on hackers. So um, there is not consensus yet on what features to support there. So I would say version 13 is the first one, because version 12, what's in version 12 is getting pretty close. The, technically, version 12 is not feature frozen, but nothing is far enough along to do that. So right now it's the, it, it's, um, um, I would say version 13 is the earliest that, that anything will like, be like that. Um, I don't know about, I don't know what Google does. I believe based on my use of them that they're using in-core logical or they're using um, in-core streaming for doing their stuff. Um, I believe, and this is speculative, um, Amazon is doing a shared storage model more like RDS on Azure. Um, because RDS, RDS's primaries do not, um, RDS's, on classic RDS, the shadow standby is a shared storage model. It's not replicate, it's not anything like Postgres replication. So they, they have the same disk mounted and it just takes over when, when, the, when it comes up. So it's not, it's just sitting there kind of provisioned but not running and then wakes up and starts using it. Aurora is a whole different world. Aurora is like a completely replaced storage engine where everything is reading off of the same disk. 
um, and has is a significant fork from community Postgres. So it, it has, um, and the, thus it has some interesting characteristics like if a, if a secondary falls more than 60 seconds behind the primary, it reboots. Hope, you know, hope, hope that behavior is acceptable. Um, and um, the good, you know, basically the, big, the biggest advantage for, to, that I see in Aurora is you only have to pay for one set of storage. So your bill's a little lower. Um, I basically consider Aurora a beta, beta quality product at this point based on my experience with it. But in fact, I'm going to be giving a talk at PGCon entitled Aurora's a Beta Quality Product. So if you, um, so I'm saying this now in case I have a horrible accident, blame Amazon. Um, <laughs> That's well, just sure kind of yeah. Um, <clears throat> classic RDS is, except for the shadow standby, the shadow, the shadow failover secondary, is basically community Postgres in this regard. Okay. And right now, my company is more or less the very basket. And I don't Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of experience with their RDS equivalent. I forget what Google calls it. Um, you know, the, the, the sealed box, you know, here's your port 5432, have a good time, the thing that RDS, like RDS. I've, um, most of my experience with Google has been running it on bare instances there. And, you know, I like, I, I actually like, I significantly prefer Google's offerings to Amazon's there um, because you have a lot more flexibility in instance configuration than you do on Amazon. For one thing, you, you can do cafeteria plan instances on Amazon, on Google where you can say, because one, one of the things that, like you say, I want, I don't need a very powerful instance, but I need tons of network, which is a very common situation in database architectures because you need to run PG Bouncer or something like that. Where PG Bouncer doesn't consume a lot of other res a lot of resources, qua resources, but it does need a lot of, of network bandwidth. Um, on Amazon, that means hope you don't mind paying for like, you know, a C5 8X. <laughs> which is, you know, breath high watering amount of money because everything moves, all the, all the facilities move in lockstep on Amazon. Uh, Google, you can tune things individually. I like that a lot better. But um, in terms of reliability, also Google stuff seems to stay up a little more um, than Amazon. It's not a huge difference, but just from well, my experience. You know, I, 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 I wouldn't like hard recommend anyone over that one. It's just Amazon stuff seems to balance more. Also, Amazon's networking is way over congested compared to Google's. Um, Amazon has really kind of bad your networking. experience is that uh, primarily in U.S. East or us in other regions? U.S. East that? and U, U.S. East, and I'd say U.S. West too, mostly. West yeah, um, U.S. East is particularly bad oh, because yeah, yeah because <laughs> it's just oversold, you know. They and they buy cheap switches, <laughs> so you know. Any um, experience you know. with Microsoft? Um, I don't have a lot of user experience with it. Um, they were a client of ours on it, and thus I am a little bit limited by what I can say. That's, I'm, ha I'm having to pick my words carefully there. Um, it seems fine to me. I mean, I, I, I would, um, I don't have a lot of experience with it as a user. So, you know, from a user perspective, mostly from an implementation perspective, you know, it's, it's like, it, re it reminds me of RDS a lot, because you know? <laughs> RDS was clearly the model for it, so. Okay. How's the Heroku doing these days? They seem fine. I mean, um, we don't, we, we're moving a lot of clients off of them, but I think that's because a lot of, we, but you have to remember there's a selection bias in just the nature of my work, in that, you know, you know, to a cop, everyone's a criminal, and to a doctor, everyone's sick, and to a database administrator, every database is ill. You know, database consultant, everybody's database has problems. But there are tons and tons and tons of really super happy Heroku clients, and we just tend to get the ones that are banging up against Heroku limitations. So that's, there's a, you know, any, in my, my view of them is heavily selection bias towards the, oh my God, we just can't make it on Heroku anymore. Let's move, move up to that. I mean, it's a different company than it was back when it was independent and not owned by Salesforce and things like that. Obviously, the, Salesforce was interested in the Postgres expertise because they have a huge internal Postgres project. So. I have no special knowledge there. It's just, you know, <laughs> they, they keep hiring Postgres people, so presumably they're having to do something rather than write Oracle queries. So. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so you mentioned the, the wall 16 meg uh, segments mm -hmm. with, uh, yeah, this morning's talk of Postgres 11 may have mentioned that uh, that's now a configurable setting a little bit. Um, yes, it can be. It, previously, you had to recompile Postgres to do it. What's your thoughts on bigger, smaller, depending on workload? Bigger is probably better, I mean, to a to extent. Like, up to, like, uh, I'm just going to make up a number. This is totally non-analytical. This is just gut feel. Let's say um, uh, 128. Um, because you're just, um, you're the, especially with wall compression on and things like that, um, if you're using stream replication, if you're only using wall shipping, then you have the, then you know, you run the risk of more data loss. One thing to be aware of though is not all tools have caught up with the idea that a wall segment can't be, can be something other than 16 megabytes. Sure. So if you're using community, you know, not community tools in the sense that stuff you get off of, you know, the PGDG repo, but other stuff. Um, be aware they may freak out, you know, like, you know, I don't know, Patroni, you know, things that, things that have to deal with wall segments directly. They may not be, they not have, may not have gotten the memo that a wall segment can be something other than 16 megabytes. It's the same thing as changing Postgres's page size. You know, there, there are probably reasonable reasons to do it, but do those, but I'm sure a lot of tools will freak out, and I'm not even sure everything can trip will work correctly with a non-8K page size, so. And in that case, you have to recompile it. So, um, so you know, it's it's if you have a really specific reason to do it, you know, you know, uh, like, but I'm and I'm not a hundred percent sure what that reason would be. But uh, you never say never. Um, then sure, but you just be aware of that. Anything else? All right. After they keep the room. Lovely. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you.